Chris Mikowski of Emerging Civil War for the American Battlefield Trust, and we are exploring Fort Donaldson today, having a fantastic time. My heterosexual life mate, Chris White, is behind the camera doing some great job for us. Gary Edelman is roaming the woods like a Sasquatch, looking for Civil War history, and our good friend, historian Greg Biggs, is gonna be with us here in just a moment. One of the things that has amazed me as we've explored this battlefield is just how big it is. We've talked about the fort itself, but more than just the fort exists here because there are outer fortifications too. And then beyond that, Grant has to have an exterior line that's gonna extend almost four miles from river to hillside where we just were in our last video. And as the Confederates are trying to break through on Grant's right, which he's not able to really fortify so much, he sees an opportunity here on the left. And to talk about that and the switch in fortunes for the the Union Army is the president of the Clarksville Civil War Roundtable, Civil War flag guru, and all-around great guy and volunteer here at Fort Donaldson, historian Greg Biggs. Greg, tell us, Grant is going to see an opportunity okay. here and seize it. Yes, he is, Chris, and this is a, it's a great point you make about that. Behind me on the hillside, uh, several hundred yards uh, due west of here, is where Charles Ferguson Smith's two remaining brigades under Cook and Lauman have formed. Again, MacArthur's brigade has been loaned to McClernand's division, and we're getting pummeled on the on the uh, the Union right. But when Grant comes back on the battlefield and deduces that it's a Confederate breakout attack, he sends a courier to Smith and he says they are strong on the on the uh, on our right, but the, which means they must be weak on the left. Would you take your division into the fort? Grant has the right man, the right place at the right time. Charles Ferguson Smith is about as old, hardcore, regular army as it gets in this uh, time frame, and he brings his d uh, division to readiness on the, the ridge behind me. They march down into the gully below, and they reform, and they will slowly start up the slopes behind me. They will order their men to load the muskets, but to keep them uncapped because he does not want them to stop and engage in a firefight. He wants them constantly moving forward. What the Confederates have done is chopped down the trees to my front and interwoven them like this as chevaux to free to break up the shoulder to shoulder Union infantry formations. And as those linear formations hit the beginnings of the trees, the nine companies of the 30th Tennessee that are brought out from Fort Donaldson proper be, uh, behind to Chris here on the camera, uh, man what had been held by Simon Buckner's division earlier that morning. So you've got about a man every 10 to 15 feet carrying smoothbore flintlock muskets. And they will stand pretty strongly here for quite a time, despite being heavily outnumbered by two full Union brigades coming up the slopes. And as they're moving through, uh, uh, Charles Smith was long flowing white mustache with his saber out. Uh, he'll be swatting guys on the rear end and saying, I'll have no skulkers in my army. Get up those slopes. Come on, men, you volunteered to die for your country, and now you can. I'm not sure that would inspire me to lay my life down, but this was 1862, a different time. So Smith's boys break through, and they will slowly get their way up here to the top, and the 30th Tennessee, the nine companies, the 10th companies back at Fort Donaldson, manning heavy artillery will break and start to run behind us through a deep ravine. The word has gotten back to the 49th and 50th Tennessee at Fort Donaldson, and they will form a new line across the higher ground on the deep ravine, about 400 yards uh, behind Chris on the camera. A great story here. The 2nd Iowa Infantry were ordered to guard a certain position in St. Louis, and they didn't do a very good job. So remember, as I said earlier, Henry Halleck was shipping guys down here as quickly as he could to Grant to give him reinforcements. Well, that's the 2nd Iowa, one of those regiments. They're ordered to march to the steamboats with their colors furled. So they're itching to get some glory back and earn a reputation as fighters. So as they're coming up the slope, probably in about the position where we are right now, the first color bearer is hit and goes down. The second color bearer picks up the colors and carries forward till he's hit and goes down. The third color bearer goes down. And finally, the last color bearer to pick up the flag, a gentleman named Voltaire Payne Twombly, carries the colors up and he will take a shot in his chest that hits, uh, hits something that stops the bullet and it knocks him down. He picks up his colors and he runs forward and slams them on the outer works to my right and to my left. You can see the Confederate outer works as we pan the camera this way a little bit. So Twombly will slam the colors down and then follow suit by the other uh, flags of the other regiments in Lauman's brigade and further down the line that way, Cook's brigade. And 
to the honor of the second Iowa goes the first colors slammed on the outer works at Fort Donaldson. The breakthrough that happens here is what's going to set up the Confederate discussion later that night with Buckner, Floyd and Pillow because when Floyd orders everybody back to the ditches. These were Buckner's ditches earlier that morning. So he's coming back down the crossroads and a gunfight breaks out with Cook's right flank. And then the darkness settles in and that breaks off the gunfight and the Confederates fall back to the next ridge line to my right. But this is what Buckner's talking about when he's telling Floyd and Pillow, I cannot hold my position because the Federals had taken it. So this is a very key part of what happens later on that night, February 15th, 1862. Now, one of my favorite Grant stories actually takes place uh, related to this action. He wasn't on the field when fighting first breaks out. He's off, actually off talking with Foote, having a consultation, as Greg talked about earlier, urging Foote, leave me some sort of uh, help on the river. And as he's coming back to the, the battlefield, he gets these messages that fighting has erupted. And as he's starting to give orders and, and take charge and come up with some sort of response to it, he's sketched holding a cigar on horseback, talking to uh, some soldiers and passing out orders. Because of that sketch, admirers of Grant start sending him cigars from all over the country. And so that becomes sort of the birth of Ulysses S. Grant's cigar fascination. Did he smoke 20 cigars a day, as is alleged in the wilderness? That was probably his maximum. But he's got a lot of cigars because people saw that sketch and sent them to him as their way of saying, thanks for your good work. I'm going to bring Gary Edelman on here for a moment because as you have been investigating the woods, looking for Civil War history, you've had a light bulb moment. You know, yeah, and as I've been walking those woods, with maybe with night vision goggles, I won't confirm any of that, but here we are at, you know, talking about one of the real Civil War actions of Charles Ferguson Smith. And, you know, you might, he's got a varied career, but his Civil War career isn't so substantial. His demise does not exactly, you know, result in him being lauded as a hero, despite anything he may have done. But the most lasting, or one of the most lasting things of C.F. Smith is really, if you go to Library of Congress and you Google Fort C.F. Smith or Fort Smith, you will be treated to some late war photographs unlike any other. The Union soldiers are lighthearted. It's right at the end of the war. A guy pokes his head through a limber, through a, through a cannon wheel. He, uh, You have a dog on top of a limber chest. You've got the guy with the coolest slippers I have ever seen in the entire Civil War. It's a it's a really varied set of photos that no one ever, 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 ever talks about, and at least that is one way that we can get closer to C.F. Smith by at least viewing photos of the fort named after him. And that was my grand night vision goggle rumination, Chris. <laughs> Standing here among fortifications, I think that's a great rumination to come to. We've got more coming up. We've alluded to Buckner's precarious position, the need for them to do something or perhaps to surrender. So we're going to head into Dover to the site of those famous talks where the Confederate Army finally throws in the towel in the largest surrender of the war up to this point, a significant surrender. And we'll talk about those details coming up. I'm Chris Mikowski. Thanks to Chris behind the camera, to Gary, to Greg. More to come. Be with us, and thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation.